This is just a video on the problems with so-called alternatives to uh, incandescent lamps. First off, you've got the newest thing that's supposed to replace them, LEDs. Problem is, is that these run hot. They're useless in any kind of application where it isn't bloody cold because these guys and this uh, Philips lamp, one of the new uh, Chinese-made uh, ambient LED ones, you can just see the yellow bit in there, which is the separated YAG phosphor from the, uh, separating that from separate blue LED so you don't have severe phosphor depreciation. And these um, American-made uh, lighting science lamps under the Home Cheapo EcoSmart branding, these use um, OSRAM power LEDs. These all run at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit above your ambient uh, temperature. So if it's in winter and it's negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit like we had uh, this past winter because it's been bloody cold because the sun's going into a maunder minimum type scenario, they're okay for that. Otherwise, no. Same with even things like this 2.9 watt LED uh, General Electric branded uh, Chinese made this one also runs on the warm side because this just uses uh, no heat sinking at all on the outside. And it runs, again, fairly warm even though it's only 2.9 watts. And from Granger, those things are over 25 bucks each, so they're bloody expensive. And the cheapest lamp here, which is this one, was 18 bucks. So, again, very expensive. Then you've got problems like with this compact frozen lamp. In addition to having horrible optical design, because again, the Helicraft discharge tube, these run very hot, and as you can see with this one, which is supposed to replace a 100 watt lamp, it's a 26 watt uh, Helicraft uh, General Electric one, about half a decade old or so. Uh, you can see it's uh, somewhat bigger than the GLS lamp it's supposed to replace. Same with things like this 42 watt lamp. Uh, Envision, that's an older uh, Home Depot uh, house branding now, it's all Eco Smart, although I think they still carry some Envision stuff. This is supposed to pull, replace a 150 watt lamp, and again, it's substantially bigger than that. Then you've got problems with these lamps running very hot, like oftentimes these get well over 150 degrees Fahrenheit to 170 degrees Fahrenheit or more. And then you've got this uh, 34 watt uh, Mexican-made September 2001 uh, Phillips Marathon lamp. This one has a warning on the package to only run the thing base down, because this one gets up to about 255 degrees Fahrenheit, around the uh, cathodes where you've got extra heating from cathode well that actually runs hotter than this 40 watt yellow lamp which gets a peak envelope temperature when it's a running of about 219 degrees Fahrenheit then you've got lamps like this all glass uh, general electric one this one is a modified version of what they sell in stores uh, this uh, just has had the uh, outer coating scraped off it just takes about 20 minutes a steady hand and a chisel but it's otherwise fairly easy to do if you can sit for 20 minutes scraping all the crap off. Problem is, is that this runs very hot, so again, this is another piece like the uh, LED lamps that I only run outside in winter when it's bloody freezing so it doesn't overheat. Because that heat is both bad for the ballast, because the ballast in these fluorescent lamps operates at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the uh, exterior of the lamp. And especially in case of enclosed lamps like this, the uh, phosphor overheats and if the phosphor gets too hot, its efficiency goes way, way down because they've got a peak uh, efficient or peak operating efficiency temperature, which is generally anywhere from about 75 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the thing. These, which run very, very hot, they run substan they run about 150 degrees Fahrenheit or more. That's not so good for efficiency; kills your efficiency of the lamp. Another thing is that with the talk about these things are too expensive and these are too expensive. That's because quality costs, like this uh, January 1990 vintage OSRAM lamp, this is pre uh, the 1993 buyout of OSRAM, by, uh, of GTE Sylvania by OSRAM, this cost anywhere from 20 bucks to 40 bucks when it was new. This is a Taiwanese made OSRAM Sylvania one, I think it's March 2006, if you know what the date code is, it's uh, C634, so you might be able to date it from that. Uh, this I got for eight bucks a few years back, so again, they're still fairly expensive. But of course, these have the optically superior multi-U-bent type discharge tube because these lamps, it'll probably not show up on the video. Yeah, it doesn't. 
or kind of you can kind of see a little line right about there. That's because the fo there's a very thick pool of phosphor. Yeah, you can see the line right there. Uh, there's a very thick puddle of phosphor that forms on the bottom of the discharge tube when these are coated because you can find videos of them being made on YouTube is that they shoot a water slurry of the phosphor up into one edge of the lamp and all drains out the other side but that's because in the but in these that leads to the phosphor pooling on the bottom and there being insufficient phosphor on the upper side of the lamp so that's one big problem with those designs then you've also got with things like reflector lamps you can see from this one the uh, helicraft one versus this uh, one that uses multi uh, view bends this is, an op this is optically a far superior design in a reflector lamp like this but they often use this because again these lamps have become somewhat iconic as far as the green movement even though these are technically inferior but that's common among the greens and of course another problem with these is that they're never act you can't really get a spot type thing the way you can from incandescent lamps because again it's a very very diffuse uh, source of light because you've got the entire surface of the glass emitting light because that's all coated with phosphor so you can't really get anything more uh, with a tighter beam than a a wide flood or a very wide flood you can't get anything like a narrow flood or a pin spot or anything like that another problem with replace, trying to replace incandescent lamps in the case of uh, 400 watt metal halide lamps like this. This are, can be an explosion risk uh, at end of life because you can see this isn't an open rated lamp where the uh, discharge tube is housed in a cord sleeve which normally absorbs all the energy in being broken by the discharge tube when it blows up. And of course the thing is, is that in addition to that these being high intensity discharge lights really like to be running at least eight hours a uh, arc strike in order to get maximum life out of the lamp. And then, of course, you've got problems like, uh, well, these uh, big incandescent lamps, these don't care about it. Like, all incandescent lamps are pretty much limited, aside from rare cases where that could cause thermal strain in the filament constantly being turned on and off. It's limited by how long the lamp is actually on over the time it's being flashed, not the uh, number of times it's flashed. And then you've got exceptionally big compact fluorescent lamps like this one, which is supposed to replace a... Uh, 300 watt lamp, but it's only rated it's only rated for 4,200 4, lumens, which is on par with a 200 watt lamp. And of course, it's rated as a 68 watt lamp. In testing, it only draws about 61 watts, so that's a problem. And then you've got uh, what are especially hard to replicate in compact fluorescent and uh, LED type uh, lighting solutions is things like this Sylvania Electric Products 500 watt R40 lamp. You can't easily get very high brightnesses out of that because in order to get anything close to uh, the amount of light produced by a big lamp or a big incandescent lamp, you need something comedically huge like this. And this was about as cheap in terms of cost as you can get for a big lamp. That one was 15 bucks from Home Cheapo. Some things that are marketed as replacing 1000 watt GLS lamps like this, I think it's a General Electric made a couple decades ago. There's no etch or anything on it that I can easily use to date it. Those are even bigger than this, and they cost, can cost upwards of uh, 70 bucks. They're bloody expensive, and you're better off just using regular lamps like these, like high-quality ones with Y adapters, and a mogul base to medium screw base uh, reducer. And, of course, what yet one, one last thing that there is no compact fluorescent replacement for is things like this, uh, Osram Sylvania, I think circa 1990s vintage um, little line lamp. Of course, these are extremely rare nowadays. This has gotten at a uh, closing hardware store, one of the last, the last one they had for a neighbor, because they've got a house that was built in the 1930s, and it uh, has some fixtures that take these, which are very hard to find. But. Yeah, there's not, and especially lamps like this um, 1990s vintage uh, South Korean made Max uh, Feet electric lamp, although they also come in some other branding like, um, I've seen some other examples and other collectors of these being made by Max Light, and uh, with some house branding by, uh, oh, 
some uh, storage uh, gifts or something like that or no not David from AE has one of these that's blue and he'll and he's got the store the store that has sold it uh, Spencer's gifts uh, yeah uh, so yeah one last problem with these big lamps is that they're very heavy like because this is magnetic ballast which of course means it's fairly high quality and it'll last because this one you can see it's been well used before I got it and it still works to this day but it's very heavy and again that's supposed to replace a 75 watt GLS lamp which is the same size as this 40 watt lamp and you can see size wise not so much so yeah these things can be a bit of a problem and especially things like one last thing is you cannot use any other technology to replace heat lamps like these it's a 250 watt uh, South Korean made uh, SOI so